Zoom Cloud, Fredcast. Hello. Let's see if anybody is here. I'm going to open my chat. There's eight participants right now, attendees. Hi, everyone. Feel free to comment on the chat. Let us know where you're from. I saw this uh, little tip from Tim Sullivan, who's one of our instructors at Sake School of America. And he was asking, like, just let us know, put into chat, who are you? Where are you from? And it was really interesting to see what areas everybody was from. Hopefully you know how to comment on the chat box um, on this Zoom webinar. If you hover your cursor around the bottom of the screen, there's a chat box that comes up, which is next to the green share screen one. Hi, Nick Tran, uh, Alan Chen from Houston, Texas. Evans Horn, I think Evan, you were able to join us last time when it was Eduardo's um, session from San Francisco. Alfredo Rodarte, oh, oh, now there's a lot of this stuff. I gotta keep up. <laughs> <laughs> Freddie from Tijuana is here. Nick Tran from Dallas, Texas is here. Mark Goldberg from Astoria, New York is here. He's the founder of the Sake Collective. He's shared his uh, website with us. Um, and he's also have created and I'm currently filming a documentary entitled Sake in America. Oh, can't wait. Oh, very cool. Um, also for attendees, I believe you can, in the bottom of the chat, you can either chat to all panelists or all panelists and attendees. So feel free to choose the all panelists and attendees. That way everybody sees your excitement and some questions. So we have 15 attendees right now. Wenasan, hi. Hey. See you, Wenasan, who's the founder of Sake School of America. We're just asking everybody to say hi to us. Let us know where you're from while we wait for everybody to have a chance to join on this webinar as uh, and Laura san and Eduardo san, who are our featured guests today. Um, I will introduce them in a second, so hold your horses. Oh, we have Agnes Maris from Brazil. Awesome. So, yeah. Welcome. Very cool. Kim san, Kim Benegas, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, he's from, she's from Brooklyn. She, yeah, she, I think. They're from Brooklyn. I'm assuming Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, <laughs> good, cool. Nice to meet everybody and spread the word. So we were just saying, if any of your friends missed this uh, webinar, we are recording it to share it with everybody else that has been uh, not fortunate enough to be available during this time. We can provide video recording um, for those that have missed it. So be sure to email us at info at sakeschoolofamerica.com to if you like the recording. Um, Itoshi-san, yes, from Queens, New York. I know we've met like virtually. Um, I'm not sure if you were able to, Not, I can't remember if it was this one, Eduardo's first session or if it was something else. We'll just wait one more minute. Um, I'll introduce uh, our sake specialist, Ida Vong, too. You might see her on the panelist screen. She is a mutual trading employee and also helping out with Sake School of America. For those of you um, who may not know, Sake School of America is a subsidiary company of Mutual Trading Company, which is a Japanese food, beverage, and non-food uh, importer and distributor. So that is how we are able to get our hands on amazing sake. You might see on Eduardo and Laura's screen there. Um, they are showcasing three, awesome. of four, three of four that they are showcasing today, some of which are new products um, and very exquisite ones. Uh, Damon San from Connecticut is here. Dan Denny from Italy. 
Italia. Italy is here. Wow, global. Very cool. All right. Well, I am going to go ahead and introduce uh, our webinar uh, panelist today, I guess. <laughs> I, my name is Sachiko Miyagi. Hi, everybody. I work for a mutual trading company and Sake School of America. I do teach the Sake and Shochu certification courses based in LA, but we do travel uh, normally and we do offer courses online. And we started doing these um, Zoom webinars with experts around America. And then you might see um, some join from Japan. So be sure to check out our website, uh, www.sakeschoolofamerica.com. There's an events page. Um, and this is our second session with Eduardo Dingler and Laura Koffer. They are joining us from Napa. Arigato gozaimasu. Thank you so much for doing this second one. So we enjoyed your first session so much that um, we wanted to go ahead and do another one. I know we have layers and layers of information that we can learn from you. Um, I want to introduce <laughs> Lucifer, um, who is joining us today. And I was fascinated that she started um, her career in Hawaii. That's really cool. And you know, to the Culinary Institute of America in Napa. Um, she worked with Karen McNeil. That's very cool. <laughs> um, she is studying for a master sommelier exam, which unfortunately was canceled this year, but um, I believe next year. Um, and she is based in Napa as well. Um, she's also worked for the Iron Chef Morimoto. And Eduardo Dingler. Um, Thank you. Um, I had the, the pleasure of going to Japan with you when you wrote for the, the panel. Um, that was a lot of fun. Yes, yes, it was great to go watch the uh, Sake Service Institute's Fifth World Sake Somli competition. Um, that was very cool. And she is the former, former Global Beverage Director for Morimoto and uh, expert in wine. You also promote shochu, which I think is very cool. I love shochu. Oh, <laughs> amazing. Yeah, love yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then deep, deep knowledge of sake. And what we had the pleasure of watching last time was kind of a role play in a restaurant of Eduardo being the sommelier and Lora-san being the customer and how, like, so learning some tips on how to effectively sell sake in an establishment. That was last time. So this time, they're gonna go over um, from the perspective of the wine buyer and the salesman, what kind of interaction might happen and tips and kind of pointers on how to effectively use your time there. I know everybody's always busy. You gotta make your pitch, you know, in a smart way. Um, so, and then secondly, um, he will go over, they will go over the kind of the staff training pointers for an establishment. So once a beverage, uh, a wine buyer, beverage director purchases the sake, then they have a responsibility for teaching the employees to effectively then um, sell it. So how do you coach your staff from the information that you just learned. So without further ado, Eduardo-san, please take it over. Awesome, well, thanks for having us and thanks everybody for making time and joining us today. And if you joined last time, you'll, you'll know, or if you get to watch it, uh, we had a lot of fun and it was more of a, as you mentioned, a restaurant setting where we, we had a role and we were talking about how to present it, how to uh, bring it closer to the customer and convince uh, some beautiful lady to to drink some sake with different dishes. So what we wanted to do this time, since we had the opportunity and we, we scrambled our heads a little bit about it, and we thought bringing something based on our experience. So Laura has been a, a corporate buyer as well for restaurants, mostly on the wine side and some spirits. And me been with the Morimoto Group and uh, for so many years. And basically, I know there's a lot of knowledge out there and, and what I love about the sake world and the beverage world is I'm always learning. But what we thought we'd do today is just share some of the things that were pretty effective for us and that maybe somebody can, can gain a little, a little ace under the sleeve from. So 
Um, with that, Laura, you want to say some words? No, um, I think that really sums it up. Yeah, I think that, like you said, uh, we're all really strapped for time and making the most of that time that you have with a buyer um, and making it as effective as possible. And then really that next step is, is the staff because like last time at Barter was a sommelier, but not a lot of restaurants and probably shortly in the, in the near future, not a lot of restaurants are going to be having many beverage professionals on the floor. So how do you get your staff excited about a beverage, excited about a new product and give them like, the tools they need to get the, get the guests on board? Well said. Yes. So um, first we wanted to touch on a little bit about how was does uh, a salesperson, somebody in, with a book of sake, uh, approaches a restaurant. So a very important point that I've learned from people coming to me or helping out other people would be basically the idea of the service that's being offered in the restaurant, right? Mm -hmm. So you had some ideas on that. Um, I always found it really helpful when people came in knowing the style of service of the restaurant. You know, that was a really good indication for, for me as a buyer that they were had some sort of interest in my business so we could do be, be business together um things i would i would keep in mind is is there a tasting menu like how big is your by the glass program how big are your selections i think that 15 minutes that you uh, a salesperson spends at the bar can really be used for reconnaissance and like or online yeah. or looking at their bar space like do they have room for something that fits like this and things like that i think that the more a salesperson comes in full of knowledge, the better they can serve uh, the buyer and, and build that relationship. Uh, a very fun aspect and something we want to touch on is restaurants that don't usually carry sake. So how do you tackle a uh, Mexican restaurant, like upscale Mexican restaurant or um, Spanish or Italian or American cuisine place that is the, the wine director is willing to, to play a little bit and it's curious or the chef or the owner? Uh, but they haven't before. So that's like the biggest thing because we can pretty much assume that a, a sushi place or Japanese oriented izakaya or whatnot, it's going to have some knowledge and some idea of it. So today we wanted to touch on like perhaps a, a pizza place. Like what are the benefits of having a, as we a lot of us know, it's a, an amazing pairing. Mm -hmm. So after reviewing the menu and getting a couple items that you, you kind of put in the back of your head as a buyer, I would say as a salesperson, I would come in and talk to the buyer and uh, approach with a few different uh, styles of sake, which here, the ones you, you sponsor are great examples. So um, for instance, first let's talk about awasake. So awasake was a newly established um, category and forgive me if I'm thirsty, but I'm just gonna open it and we're gonna taste it as we talk. But, uh, and as we mentioned earlier, if we had a, if we were outdoors, we would save it, but we don't wanna break any windows today. But uh, so awasake was established in 2016 as a category of sake, um, which was uh, actually certified. There's a label on the back, you see the certification, and it has to be 100% domestically grown uh, rice. It has to have a natural uh, fermentation in bottle or uh, secondary fermentation, which will allow the, uh, the bubbles, and it has to be minimum 3.5 PSI. So, Similar to Champagne or Method Champenois, as you would in the, in the wine world. Um, so this is an excellent foot in the door for a place that has never offered uh, sake before. So you have uh, some mousse and you have uh, some bubbles, some pretty exciting style. This one in particular is from Iwate, this is Nam uh, and it's a beautiful style. But uh, something like this kind of opens the door, get some suggestions, like what would the best pairing be for this? If I were pitching this, or if I were thinking about a pizza place list, I would say, do you, do you have a Prosecco on your list? And looking at that and saying, obviously, you know, it's a fast moving category, like, like bubbles, people can get behind that, relating it to something that they're familiar with and saying, this, is, this would be a perfect, um, perfect addition. You know, it's not as sweet as Prosecco. It's got that nice flavorful mouth feel and that bubbles to it. Um, so I think pizza this, margarita, old day. I, I think yeah, this would fried be fried calamari. Like fried, fried calamari, perfect. You know, you start to paint the picture of how this fits into your program, um, and then it doesn't seem so so foreign. Um, and this fits a bouchon. 
Yeah. I would make sure if I was selling, I'd make sure they see me put a bouchon over this. So they're like, oh, I get it. Right. It can, it perfectly works, you know, in any sort of wine program. Yeah. And that's an excellent example where you don't need any special glassware because you're treating it just like your house sparkling or your high end champagne kind of fits in there. Obviously same packaging. And it's a great story to tell, which will lead us into the, the actual staff training. But the parent suggestion, just being knowledgeable about what the menu that they're offering is pretty important. Like, do they sell a caprese salad with tomatoes and mozzarella, or do they have a, a fajitas or something like that? That you would actually connect the dots, make it make it easier for the buyer to say, "Oh, well, that's great. That that would be an incentive for us to bring something." So, we can talk. Uh, Sarah had an amazing seminar on, on how about selections to put on your list, but that would be like a furthermore, and I, I really highly recommend it. So you you kind of research that and see that how you build your list when you haven't had one but next if there's no questions or if anybody has a question about uh, this we just covered we can go into the the actual staff and how do you present it to a staff that's completely foreign to sake i'm wondering how you like the sake <laughs> so far. Oh, I, well it's my like fourth step i'm almost done with the glass <laughs> is it it's really it's it's very dry um it has that really nice cleansing quality to it. There's a little bit of fruit, a lot of kind of minerality. Mm -hmm. Like I was thinking oysters with this, but again, oh. if, you're, if you're going into a pizza place, don't say this is great with oysters because they're like, that's yeah, not, if that's they don't not sell oysters, you're actually <laughs> yeah, you're just crossing yourself off. <laughs> um, but I think this would be a great shellfish um, sake. I think with, with any sort of raw bar would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, Fried seafood. But yeah, this could work its way up to yeah, caviar and Mm -hmm. Anything fried. Yeah, this could bring you a lot. Uh, another big example that I've seen at a, a lot of friends' uh, restaurants or the run restaurants is a uh, pairing menu on a French style driven restaurant. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a handful of places that we can think of, like for instance, a French laundry here in Napa Valley, uh, places like that, that have really opened a big door into the sake world by allowing those sakes to pair with the menu. So um, there's, for instance, at the French Laundry, the oysters and pearls, which is an outstanding uh, dish with a little uh, emulsification of butter and caviar and oyster and sake. It's, it's just an incredible parent for it. But try to always allow for other things that are non-fish non or, or seafood to, to play with. So pretty fun one. I think that this, this sake is delicious. Um, uh, this kosuke san has done an amazing job and they, they obviously have all the credentials and I've gotten a lot of awards uh, emerging out of uh, the Iwate Prefecture in the, from Nambu Bijin. So, really fun. Um, I'll later um, nail down the pricing, but that is really pretty. Um, so, let's move into the staff. So, let's talk about how do we approach it. So. Oh, sorry, Eduardo san, we do have a question. Um, well, one suggestion from Mark Song, Mark Goldberg, says ceviche. Uh, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> the best friend of ceviche all day, like Peruvian style ceviche or or Mexican or Latin America. It's definitely right up the alley. That's great. And in sake advisor class, we talk about um, how sake is much higher in lactic acid mm -hmm. with pizza, like um, like melted cheese, and also how it's high in succinic acid, which would be like scallops and any seafood. So. That those are strengths that um, that maybe sake can offer that uh, perhaps wine cannot sometimes. Exactly, that's a great point you're making there that we slightly touched on last time. When you have dishes that are harder to find to pair, like artichokes, as asparagus, things like Tomatoes that. Tomatoes can be a kind of challenge, but yeah, there's for wine, yeah, um, definitely more applications. I think pairing menus are a great inroad to to that you know, non traditional food, but. Uh, yeah, if you can get um, if you can get food in front of people with these two, I think that's always always amazing. Yeah, um, and I wanted to say, Mark, when the whole quarantine is over, we'll meet for ceviche and sake. Hopefully, <laughs> you say where and when. But uh, moving on, it's a, it's a great segue. When you have when I was running the the program at Morimoto and had a, a number of employees, it's really hard as a restaurant to make a mandatory meeting uh, every so often and pay the staff to come in and do a two, ideally two, three hour sake education and, and uh, tastings, right? And parents. 
But what, what we switch for instead is, and some a lot of restaurants do, is having a dedicated 15 to 30 minutes, perhaps a day, uh, if you can afford it, otherwise like once a week, where you can condense the information and bring it forward to the staff. And one of the points is, if uh, you have a great relationship with the kitchen, obviously for the same, uh, working towards the same purpose, work with the, with the kitchen team, with the chef, and create little bites of something that you feature in the menu that you think is an amazing pairing with sake and bring it out there. And if it's practical and, and easily, it could be amazingly done. It would be a replacement of family meal in a restaurant while you're talking about the sake. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think a great thing to do if you do get that, if you, if you make the sale with the buyer, is say, is put on the books that day. Great, you're, you're gonna bring this in. When can I come in and talk to the staff and be at 15 minutes or, or longer? But getting that time in front of the staff, I think is so key. And, um, I tried in every in, all, in my restaurants to make sure that, that the reps had time in front of the staff to really talk through the products um, and then get the staff the information because they're going to be your best your best ambassadors. They're the frontline troops. Um, I've seen it a, a few times. So and, I and we would do we would do some long ones where we would have food, but we'd also do these short impromptu. Give me your five minute elevator pitch to get get these in front of the staff. So there's there's always options. It's whether it's a, a day or 15 minutes. And again, selling sake and putting it in front of more people, it's a crusade. And selling it to the buyer, to the restaurant, it's only this part of the battle. Yeah. Because <laughs> you bring it in, they bought a case or six bottles, whatever it is, something it is, and they have a pairing in mind. But if there's no further education, and as Laura mentioned, putting a date right there and making it happen, because as a buyer, you're really busy too. You have things coming from all angles, and you're answering phone calls, and I mean, that's with one restaurant only, and if you oversee more, it's just forget about it. But right on the spot, you, you get, put it you get the date. second date booked on the first date. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's, absolutely, it's absolutely key. <laughs> Otherwise, things, and then it never happens, and it just sits there, and the thing that, as a buyer, you were excited about, and you were excited that day, just kind of falls, and then the menu changes, and then it just becomes, it, it doesn't serve anyone. So I always found it was like, okay, let's just set a date. You're going to be back here on Thursday. I'm going to give you 15 minutes before lineup. Get you at least in front of a few people, and then they talk about it. And then it begins. It, it has a snowball effect. But yeah, you have to set that. Yeah, set ideally that you have the core employees, uh, and you create an incentive to for them to come. So to say, hey, we're going to be tasting all this stuff. Yeah. Blah blah. <laughs> Even if it's your day off, just come and try to make it exciting. Um, so the first thing is laying down the sake basics, and something that obviously you're running against the clock as we are right now, mm -hmm. but you're running against the clock in front of your staff and you don't have time to go into all the little nuances and, and um, uh, ingredients and everything that goes into sake, uh, methods and, and regionality and all this. So you have to simplify it. And first of all, you have to break the glass that's in front of the most, most people that, that have never worked with sake before and say, okay, we're gonna break this glass door and we're gonna really can I give you a quick overall on what sake and what is not? So you talk a, a little bit about it's not distilled, it's uh, the production of it, which we all, all know, but having the, the basics for ingredients. And then some I really enjoyed and I proved it and I thought it was very effective with my staff all over the, the world was um, just talking about the, the sake specific brings you a lot of, opens a lot of doors. Rather than spending two hours going into everything and start losing people, then you grab like a brand and you say, okay, this is the Yokoyama. This is from Iki Island. Uh, it's a tiny island next to Fukuoka. It's a fourth generation brewery run by two brothers. And it's an amazing style. It has this, then you start opening, you start talking to the staff. One, one of my tips, I always made one of the staff members do the opening. I would hand them the bottle and say, you open this and pour it for everyone. Cause it got everyone like, alert that they might be called on for something it got them comfortable opening it was an opportunity for me to keep talking and them to do the pouring and it was always that moment where I'm like oh, oh okay and like they had to like get a serviette and do it okay you're gonna pour you're gonna you're gonna do the service just it, it just was another opportunity for them to interact with the product exactly start getting familiar what, what do i do with the what do, what do i do with this and you can start yeah. to walk them through all those questions on the fly Totally. You talk about the glassware and how you serve it, you're putting it in front of them. You're telling them two, three points. So this is something that uh, the Court of Masters, and Laura specifically, uses a lot and got me into doing. 
the elevator pitch. Oh yeah, three things, just three things. You, you don't have time in a restaurant, your staff doesn't have time, but they can usually remember three things. Like, um, you know, the, the uh, style, like a quick flavor profile, a dish maybe that goes with it, and one fact about the brewery or one fact mm -hmm. about it. And, and this applies to every beverage. That is it. it. Yeah. That's all you really realistically have time for. This one comes in a can. It's uh, a Hanjozo, you know, and it tastes like this. Like that, that's really all you're going to get because that's really the end product that the, a lot of staff, a lot of busy restaurants are going to have. So you give them that elevator pitch. Give me this product in three sentences. Exactly. And that's kind of resonates. And always try to, another thing I really enjoyed is having the staff throwing the ball at them and say, okay, now that you, you've tasted it, right? You swirl it, you smell it, you taste it. Now, give me two descriptors, something that applies to your world. And you don't have to put them in the spot. You don't have to make them sweat. And wanna, <laughs> you don't want to make them want to run away. <laughs> but you want to make them feel comfortable and say, hey, I smell stone fruit and I smell pineapple. Okay, great. Write those down. That is, pertains to your world now. Everybody, you can share with everyone. And that's something you're going to use with your customer. The other thing is out of your menu that you know very well, ideally, from your restaurant, what, what would you pair with this? What, what does your brain tell you to, to just go wild and suggest it with? So those were two things. And then the other component you can tell them is like, as I mentioned, it's uh, from a tiny island uh, next to Fukuoka. It's the two brothers run it. Um, this is a clean style with a lot of tropical notes. And they grab two or three of those things and it just kind of sears in their brain, whether they write it ideally or not, it becomes a tool in the back of their pocket. And now when they go to the table, they can actually be educated about and not just say, well, we have a sake and we suggest it with this, but now you have some, some tools yeah, on there. It's Sauvignon Blanc like, it's kind of tropical, it's made on an island. And already that like paints this picture of something kind of fun and, and accessible to people. And, and I mean, it, it just, it sells it in a way that, um, that any staff member can grasp onto, I think. Totally. And then uh, moving on with the, with the ones we have here, we can talk about the Tachiriki, which is from Honda Shoten and basically the godfather of Yamai Nishiki rice, um, a style that's very beautiful around. Uh, uh, they do produce some sake that are iconic and very cult-like on uh, the higher price range. And something that Honda-san told me when I met him one time, and I heard him say a couple of times, was they wanted to be like the Domine, the DRC basically of, of rice growing, just having those the skis and for a restaurant uh, that's mainly educated on wine and has a connection and their elevated service, that really resonates. It's like, wow. So they're now connecting it to the wine world DRC and this is what they're aiming for. And this is a standard race pretty high with uh, the godfather of the rice trend that's being used here, which is pretty, pretty important. What I heard was uh, DRC. So I think Pinot Noir, it's mushroomy. I think risotto. Mm -hmm. Sold. <laughs> it's really pretty though. It's really beautiful. It's got a lot of that umami to it. But I think once you start, yeah, you throw out those keywords, you ask them to repeat back their elevator pitch, and, and it kind of starts to sink in and resonate. This would go well in your pizza restaurant. Absolutely. Well day. Or Mexican restaurant. Mm -hmm. This could do very well with some like mole or tacos and things like that. Now the without going too fast, and unless there's any questions, um, there's the other component that always works out really well, and Laura has been very effective with it in, in her restaurants. It's the sales incentives and competitions. So give us some examples of it. Um, the, 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 I think like, the, yeah, the last thing you do, you've gotten the buyer on board, you got the staff on board, the last thing before you leave, like that third date is to get a sales contest going. You offer some sort of incentive, some sort of, a, what be it a bottle i mean just the nature of com competition i think really drove a lot of my staff a lot of times um we would do a game called connect five it looked like a bingo board and it had like different items on it and they had to get five in a row any which way it could be different bottles different cocktails different food but they did that and they got a gift card to something or they got a bottle of wine or we all have all of those types of things but i think just that like 
Eduardo ran tons of contests um, and things had point values and, and things like that that just keep every service instead of having to go over these four sake you go hey remember we're having that sales competition about those four that we tasted last week and you'll see them run to the wine list go which ones were they which one what did i miss did i want to win something so it was always it it forced them to <laughs> force them to keep going back to their notes mm -hmm. um and play along and uh they learned it by accident so sales incentives were are huge yeah something i always saw with my teams um was that you came, you got them excited and you, you like, you can, you can get them excited about selling a steak or a bottle of wine or some spirit or vodka, whatever it is. But once they're excited, they've tasted it, they took the notes, but then they go back to the, their normal. So if they're happy selling the one bottle of Cabernet and then they have the socket that they learn about, they're excited, but they don't have an incentive to kind of promote it out there. So that's why those competitions come out pretty well. And it could be, um, ideally coming from the, the salesperson, but sometimes the actual uh, wine buyer, uh, we, we actually came up with those, whether it was a sample of something or, uh, I don't know, a, a gift card or whatever it was, it created that synergy and kept the, the product going. And once, as Laura said, it's, it's just a learned behavior and you enjoy it. And you get that one person on staff, there was one person at Morimoto that you'd see making a flight of these for seven people around a table and being like, oh my God, <laughs> they're going to crush the contest. And it just hypes everyone up, else up and reminds them that we're excited about these new, these new products. So I highly, highly recommend if you have the means to, to do that. Definitely. And that's pretty much what fun. we have to share. And we trying to learn every day, as we said, and it was just <laughs> a fun experience for, for us. So. Our, our notes from the trenches. <laughs> <laughs> I love that um, Lora-san makes, like puts people on the spot and make them open it because once it becomes their experience, they're so much more confident. And I feel like sake is one of those things, even the most established sommelier sometimes are like, uh, need a little push because they don't want to do injustice to the product so if they haven't seen it with their eyes and intimately like all the wines that they know they just need a little bit of push and then just that that simple act makes it their own and i'd love for it if everybody could provide a bottle of sake as a reward <laughs> maybe competition because drinking it at home a whole bottle you know or sharing it with your friends really gives you the opportunity to see it in different temperatures different vessels and like pairing it with different things and that much of an intimate experience with the liquid really becomes their own, I think. And hopefully they, you know, they don't love just selling it and enticing people, but also like really love drinking it too. Um, but um, I love that. Um, let us know if you have any questions, everybody. I know we've gotten a lot of comments about like how to get the video from last time. Please email us at info at sakeschoolofamerica.com and uh, we can provide the recording from the last one. Um, we can provide yeah, you can always email me too and on further questions that are not answered there or, or you guys, uh, eduardo mm -hmm. at sakedrinker.com or you can follow yes. me at sakedrinker on Instagram. And yes. I would love to hear from you guys. But yeah, continuing the sake synergy going and, and making the world of sake a smaller place as we uh, move forward, that's, that's definitely our crusade. Yes. Um, would there be a Jeffrey in New York? J-F-R-E in New York this year. Oh, the um, Japan Food and Restaurant Expo for in New York, unfortunately, is canceled. Um, due to COVID. However, they are planning online series, um, and that's our New York um, branch, but that we are really closely in touch with because Saki School of America has a branch there. Um, I was just talking to Masai-san um, this morning, and she was saying that they're planning like different weeks. So one week might be beverage focused that everybody can watch online. And then one week might be food focused. Um, so some educational material coming out in September, which is normally when they have the food show. And that's where a lot of us um, learn more about the product by having a face-to-face -face with the maker or the rep 
and be able to answer questions, um, things like that. Eduardo San, I know you've repped a lot for us um, at. I'd the, like to hope whenever I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in San Francisco for um, the one that True Sake hosts, mm -hmm. uh, Sake Day, which is usually around International Sake Day, which is October 1st. Um, last year you had. Um, or the Yokoyama Gochu, the yeah, actually, yes. that you had, right? And a few other kind of cool new products. I think you may have did the um, poured the Izumi Bashi for us too. Yeah, Kurotombo, yeah. You showed a Kurotombo from last year, which was also Kimoto. Um, the Shibori Tate in the can. Um, yes, that's an amazing sake. It's, uh, yes. Honjoso Namagenshu, uh, just beautiful, very rich. This sake. Um, um, has a beautiful way to, to pair with like uni mm -hmm. or abalone or um, what else do we like to do with, with this one? Uh, just richer fare that, that kind of has a little more stamina and richness to it. It does amazing. I mean, not to say that a, like a pancetta pizza won't do really well mm. as well, but yeah, I think we're all getting hungry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even barbecue. Yes. This is a great pairing for barbecue because it, it really embraces the, the salty, sometimes sweet, smoky qualities of, of barbecue. This one kind of hugs it like a sumo wrestler giving you a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's from Yamanashi Prefecture, which is where um, Ueno-san is from. And uh, Iravang, the specialist. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's where they have the Japanese wines too. Um, they have a geographical indication there. Um, I was saying Iravang, our sake specialist, um, has a column called Sake Splash on the same part, same like part of the website. Awesome. Post about uh, Eduardo's sessions um, and doing a review on it and just talking a little bit about the. Uh, the brewery. I'm sorry. I'm. I'm not sure. I'm doing a really good job of like following every. There's so many comments. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, Justin is asking which sake is that again? The canned one is Tani Zakura Shibori Tate. Shibori Tate means just freshly squeezed. So it is a Nama Genshu. Um, it's unpasteurized, so no heat, no heat treatment to make it shelf stable. So you'll see it in the refrigerated section. Um, and Asahi no Yume Rice, which is quite unique, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot more um, sake rice varietals coming out these days, um, some of which went extinct during the war or new research coming out. Um, so that's really exciting. Um, we have sake drinker for Instagram, right? And then Eduardo at sakedrinker.com for everybody to contact Eduardo for his expertise. Or just to chat. Or, or so it's I can learn chat. from you. I just want to hang out with anyone. <laughs> I just want to talk sake. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or choke you. Yeah. <laughs> we actually have a question from Hiroko-san. Is there a difference between awa sake and sparkling sake? Yes. So that's a big one. And something maybe that, that we need to emphasize is that awa sake, it's an organization that started in 2016. The sake under the Iowa sake label, and such a good you know more than me on this one, but basically, <laughs> I'm pretending I, I do more, more than you, but um, has to be at least 3.5 PSIs on, on, the, on the carbonation, yes, yes. atmospheres, thank you, and it has to be 100% domestically grown rice in Japan, uh, and there's a couple little other things, but sparkling sake in general, you can... Um, you can carbonate it. It's more like uh, when you look about champagne, AOC versus Prosecco. Prosecco is made in a char matter tank method, which is carbonated. And also there's some sparkling sakas in which um, there has been uh, an addition of flavors or colors or different things where our sake has to be 100% clear and only the, the four main ingredients. Yes, exactly. So we are adding that to our sake advisor textbook. Um, there's going to be a page about Awasake because like Eduardo San said, it's a fairly new organization um, founded in 2016. And there's the, the number of uh, breweries that are part of this Awa uh, Sake Association is growing. So it was like 12 breweries, maybe like a year and a half ago or two years ago, and it was 15. Now it's 21. Um, so more and more people are joining. Um, it's basically to raise the uh, bar. 
Oh, Lorasan has a question. Yeah. Wait, so these 15 producers, they do they all produce it start to finish in their breweries? Or are they going to like a, like here we have places that do sparkling, you know? The, from my understanding, they produce it in-house at their oh, wow. brewery and they do like the turning of it and they have to get the yeast out, you know, at the end. So um, it's a very meticulous process. I know the president of uh, Awasake Association went through like close to 800 trials before he came up with Is their- Is this Nagai-san? Nagai-san, yes. Yeah, we visited him okay. two years ago. We went there. Oh, we in Japan. Kuruma, and we went to visit him because we fell in love with, I fell in love with the Awasake. Oh, and, great. Um, when we got there, he didn't want to show us the room. He <laughs> oh, he's secretive. Yeah. Very uh, secretive. Definitely, <laughs> yeah. It's definitely so, his pride. Yes. He and, picked us up at the train station. We had a four-hour lunch. Oh, yeah. He toured us the brewery real quick with his toji. And then he dropped us at the at this. We drank <laughs> it, and it was just it was it was mind blowing. It was so amazing, and we toured the entire place. And then he's like, you know, in that room, <laughs> we do the sparkling, and then he said, well, you're like, late. we gotta go. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, he's amazing. He's great, yes, great like top. kind of a little bit crazy in like the best possible way. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, the kind of that Japanese mentality of like really perfecting their craft. Um, I know that when you went to like Champagne region to learn for mm -hmm. two weeks, you know, people, people in that region were the same way. They were like, well, you can intern with us for two weeks, but we're not going to tell you all the secrets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very secret. Yes, but Nagai-san also, you know, his wife is from like, uh, worked in Napa, so you might See yeah, Kazumi, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's the one I connected with when I went. Oh, okay, visit. okay. Yes, yeah, I thought I you might know them. Married yet? I don't remember. Mm. But yeah, <laughs> great people. So, yes, <laughs> yes, amazing, amazing. I love seeing the common threads between um, sake and wine, and how sake makers get inspired by um, by wines like. Uh, like Senking or Gangi makers or totally. the Awasaki Association. Yes, and Awasaki Association. Yes, yes. And the first bottle, um, that sure, can you lift up the sparkling bottle? Oh, and the, oh perfect. Yes, that, that one was developed for Tokyo Olympics 2020. Oh, I missed that. Yes, so Nagai san, the president of Awasaki Association, went to Kujisan from Nambuji and said, we, we'd love for you to, you know, make something that's appropriate for your Olymp Tokyo Olympics. And they, uh -huh. but yeah. now 2021, but <laughs> now we have two years to enjoy sake, um, sparkling sake. And for those of you that missed it last, uh, last session, Eduardo San was um, talking about kind of the amazing pairing possibilities of uh, Shirakabe Gura Mio with mm -hmm. CO2 we injection, sake, yeah. mm -hmm. with sparkling sake, uh, not awa, but um, fairly affordable and very delicious uh, and kind of a crowd pleaser, something that you can open people's eyes with about sake. Open doors. Yeah. I can't see very well because uh, I'm kind mm -hmm. of blind and far from my computer, <laughs> but I think Mark had a question about keg sake. Yes, I know. It looks like it. Um, ooh, ooh. Uh, it was kind of general. It just says, what about sake on tap? Uh-huh. So basically draft sake, right? But it could be pretty much any sake, um, just conveniently packaged in a, in a keg, uh, which could be different sizes and easy to pour, uh, more economic for a restaurant as well, but not necessarily sparkling or any kind of method. Uh, a lot of, a few times I've seen more nama, but what do you guys think? Yeah, I think some nama, um, when you go to like local breweries, perhaps in America, um, you may be able to see some effervescence in the on the palate, which is really, really enjoyable. You can um, often for nama, which is unpasteurized, so it's without heat treated, it's super fresh. So it, I love it. Like the, the, the enzymes are still kind of alive and like dancing on your tongue and you're like, oh, I'm so happy to be alive and joining <laughs> Enjoying this really fresh sake. Um, Have you guys had many with CO2 addition? Um, well, 
I've had a few. Yes, so Neo Sparkling is one. Um, okay. Oh, in a keg. Um, so they do do some uh, in tank secondary fermentation um, for sparkling sake. Mm -hmm. um, but I've only had it uh, in a bottle because that's made in Japan. Yeah. Um, I know that some makers are talking about like nigori sparkling, which is dangerous to bottle because it's still fermenting in the bottle. Yeah. Um, but me, oh, coming yeah, I mean, craft sake brewery background, we've definitely tried it and it exploded in the refrigerator. It's not re recommended, but we wanted to share it. <laughs> it was messy, but it was nobody got hurt and uh, it was delicious for sure. Really? Um, so I know local brewers are trying to figure out ways to make it available um, because it's so delicious, but, and I love everything sparkling, but um, it's, I haven't really had anything that's kegged that's sparkling. Me neither, actually. Thinking about it, I don't know yeah. if there's something about it or just not as popular yet. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a buyer, I, I, we had a, a tap wine system. We had, I think, five on, on one of my restaurants, and I loved it. I love the keg system. Mm -hmm. I think as far as just waste and bottles and as the person has to carry the stuff around, um, I, I think kegs are, are the really... And less impact on the environment. Yeah, all of it. I mean, you're just, I, I love the idea of keg programs and those bars that you go to where you get the wristband and you go around to the different kegs and there's wine and there's beer. I think those are, those are just such, just a great idea, so. All yeah, and co coffee has wet nitro. Um, oh, yeah. They have the, like, creamy kind. So mm -hmm. I'd, be, I'd be down. I'd be down to try that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really fun. All right. Am I missing any other questions? Um, Evan said that you could always force carbonate a non-carbonated sake in a keg or even fill a corny keg with sake and force carbonate. Yes. So Evan, we'll let's have a party and do that. Yeah, let's you say <laughs> what? Let's install one in the house. <laughs> it's a, a, a small gathering of keg party sake and then we can carbonate it on the side. <laughs> I am in. I think I we've had some people experiment with like the, the handheld kind of like what looks like a um, whipped cream maker. Like an ISI. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Like to do that um, just for fun. Um, and Mako-san says he's going to ask Shinobu from Kato Sake Works if he taps because Kato oh. Works is a new, uh, newer brewery that opened up in Brooklyn, Kura, uh, not heard about it. in addition to Brooklyn Kura, um, in Brooklyn. And so it's cool to have like local sources of people like brewers and people. So thank you Eduardo-san for making your email oh, thank you guys. For people to comment and ask you, Rora Santu, thank you so much. Uh, My pleasure. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, we're not announcing anything at this moment, but we'd love to revisit this kind of format. And if anybody has suggestions, um, again, please let us know. And if there's no other questions, uh, we think- There is uh, actually one question oh, oh, sorry. from Aya, <laughs> thank you, Aya san oh, It's in the well. Q&A. So oh, she oh. asked Laura, uh, would you consider bringing in awasake for your restaurant as a buyer? Um, yeah, actually. I think because it would keep, it would, people would understand it. Um, it would, I think it's really easy to have something like this where you can greet a table with it and give them a little bit and just, like, you know, really wow them. Um, yeah, absolutely. I love all things bubbles too, so. Um, I think the key there is cost prohibitive. So if the price works. To, right. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, but there are some, uh, like for instance, speaking of uh, Nagai-san, his, his cost oh, in yeah. the bottle is about $80 plus. And this is a couple years ago, last time I, I bought some. And it, it's hard to sell it because now you're you're paying. Uh, you could also see a price as a Don Perignon or uh, I don't know a, a Tete Cuvée from our, uh, some producers on the list. So somebody would say, "Why would I pay two hundred dollars plus, depending on your markup, for some that's going to be a gamble I've never had before?" So you kind of run into that. Yeah, I, I guess that's that's a that's a good point. But it feels like a twenty dollar cost. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, you can pour it like water. You can have people try it. You can put it in the first course on the tasting menu uh, for your locals, your VAPs, you kind of introduce them to it. Yeah. I think that's where the meal sparkling becomes a really cool uh, 
available product that it doesn't break the bank and also uh -huh. opener. We do have another question from Nicholas. So do you think it's a good idea to use wine vacuum quartz for open bottles of sake to preserve freshness? Um, he's asking for sake by the glass service. I personally don't because sake uh, is so forgiving and you have a, a window, let's say a month or so, uh, depending, having it in the fridge. So you have plenty of time to, to, uh, to pour it. And as we mentioned last time, there are some sakes uh, in our fridge right now yeah. that are months, I mean, some nearing a year. And we revisit them as a, just as an experiment and uh, they, they're pretty forgiving. I mean, it's changed from the original what it was supposed to be, but it doesn't spoil like wine, doesn't turn into vinegar. So I have uh, not been a fan. However, on that note, you know the Corvan system in which you access the bottles through the cork. They developed a new thing. I wish I had it handy so I could show you. They sent me a few. So it's basically a screw cap with a membrane and you can access through Corvin if you're if you really don't want to um, affect it or get some oxygen in there. Yeah. But normally in the house or at a restaurant, I never really did that. Um, but yeah, there could be the, the one sake that you say, well, I'm not going to open it again until six months or I just want to taste it. Then you put the, the screw cap, you access it with the Corvin system, and then you put it away for a while. Yes, and I think that um, sake, it really differs bottle by bottle how they mature after opening. And some people love it uh, to enjoy the like how it matures. Um, sometimes it's done uh, on purpose. General rule is that you want to enjoy sake, you know, fresh and young uh, after opening, but there's always exceptions to the rule. And uh, to be sensitive to that uh, concept, I think is, is a good thing. Also, uh, when they bottle at the brewery, they're starting to use liquid nitrogen and other um, liquid gas to force out the air and then using a cap that will keep it in. So to help with, um, uh, with it being fresh, but also the quality being preserved. So we're starting, it's still a very small amount um, of premium sake, but um, it's more and more. Um, I believe the Nambu Beijing bottles, the cap is changing. So they're always looking way for ways to give you the freshest, delicious product um, in a very geeky, <laughs> geeky meaning like, let's mean that in the best possible way, but um, like, yeah, scientific kind of like laboratory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, if there's any other questions, and I'm sorry if I've missed anything, please contact us at info at sakeschoolofamerica.com or you can also ask Eduardo San and Nora San directly um, through his sake drinker Instagram. Yeah, the experts. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have the educational material if you need anything. So um, thank you again. Thank you so thank much. Thank you for joining thank us. You for joining. We'll see you next Bye. time. Bye. Thank you.